Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Just give everyone a chance to settle. And we'll just look at some announcements for the incoming week. Amen. All youth departments are on this week. Uh, senior Corral, your, meet, uh, your, nor your normal uh, rehearsal on Tuesday evening. Uh, this is indeed the month of prayer. Let's remember to pray between 11 and 12 and 6 and 7 all through the month, as I say, of February. This Tuesday, Memory Lane is on, again, Senior Corral. Uh, we have a men's discussion group in the boardroom at 7.30. And Wednesday evening, uh, our prayer meeting, we are having from Whitewell, Pastor Erwin Ray is going to come along and share God's Word with us on Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, we have the early morning prayer meeting. Then we have uh, Tots and Toddlers. This Friday is our awesome ladies fellowship in the coffee bar at 8 o'clock. There's a guest speaker, Olive uh, Turkington. Uh, the title of uh, what she's going to be talking about is It's in the Bag. So everyone's asked to bring a bag that has a story or a memory. Uh, upcoming events on the 30th of March, Festival of Brass are holding a concert for the church. And Peter Corey will be here and the Northern Ireland Concert Band. So that'll be at 7.30. And all proceeds, as I've said, is going towards the church for this event. So let's just worship the Lord along with the praise team. Good evening, church. Why don't we just stand together?
Amen. Just going to bring this service before the throne of grace. Going to ask one of our elders, Brother Roy Simpson, would you come along, Roy? And just bring these needs before the Lord. Quite a list of names, uh, but we know our brother won't remember them all, but the Lord knows them, and we're confident to leave them with him. We're thinking of Jim Halliday, Sam Reed, Sister Connolly, Mara Kennedy, Sister Elaine Bailey in hospital, Sister Lila Thompson, who's in a lot of pain. We just pray for her, Margaret Kelly. Uh, we don't know if she's still in hospital. We're with her this afternoon. And uh, she was just waiting on results and whether or not they were going to keep her in. Uh, we're thinking of Colette McGibney's brother who was taken into hospital. And we're obviously praying for a lady called Doreen. This is the lady that Joan and Jim look after. And she's very ill at the moment. We're also remembering Sister Lottie Wright. If you have a need in your heart, indicate it by raising your hand. We'll ask Roy just to bring these needs before God's throne, praying a blessing on his word and in the ministry of music and song. Heavenly Father, it's always a privilege, Lord, to come into God's house, Lord, just to thank and to praise you, Lord. No wonder, Lord, we can sing your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. Lord, as we heard this morning, we come here this evening, Lord, with the garments of praise on, just to worship and magnify your name for all you have done. Lord, we remember Calvary, Lord. We remember your sacrifice, Lord. And that's why we love you, Lord. We're free. Our sins are forgiven. And Lord, we come again in the promise, Lord, that, that you've told us to pray without ceasing, Lord. Lord, we bring these needs before you. Lord, you know every name, Lord, and you know every need. Lord, you've even got the names in the palm of your hand. Lord, we just pray in your name, Lord, that you will touch, you will heal, and you will comfort, Lord. Everybody's name has been said and done this evening, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, you hear us. And Lord, for the word of God, we pray, Lord, you, the word of God, pastor's name, the word of God may be uplifted, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for this morning, for his word, Lord, and may our hearts and our ears open again, Lord, that we be more about you. Lord, we thank you for everything. Lord, I pray for their praise team, Lord. Thank you for their worship. I pray for the singers tonight, Lord, that you will undertake and fill them, Lord, with the Holy Spirit as they sing their power and praise unto you. Lord, we thank you for everything. Lord, for every upraised hand, Lord. We acknowledge you, Lord, that your mighty name is power. Lord, and you've and you're also got that folly of care, Lord, to hear every request we make it, Lord. We thank you, Lord. May we continue, Lord, to praise you and your presence, Lord. Thank you for everything. For your name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Just a moment. The senior chorale is going to come along and lift up the name of the Lord. I think again, I'd just like to thank everybody that was involved last Sunday. It was a great night, and it was so good to see some new faces in our church. I was just blessed, folks, during the week. I was driving along in the car. I was listening to UCB1. Don't know if any of you tune in, but there was an English pastor there, and you know something? It was like listening to myself here, and I'm talking, and that's what blessed me. He spoke about how whatever church, I didn't catch where he was from, which denomination, but how they've changed their Sunday night service, and how it's more relaxed, more informal, and how every one of their churches has experienced growth. And he said, but we've been saying all along, society today, they, they, they don't know about church. They, they feel uncomfortable coming into these buildings. And it just bless me that we are in God's will and plan. When you hear someone who you've never heard of, don't even know, reflecting the exact same things that you're saying and what you feel God is saying to you. So church, we're on the right path. Uh, keep supporting it. Our next uh, one is uh, Svein Eigel. And I'm not going to try his last name. Richard could maybe do that for me later. But he's been here before. He has richly blessed us. And I know anybody that comes along will enjoy this man's ministry. So be encouraged. Invite someone. Uh, like we said uh, then, or I think it was Wednesday night, we tried this. Just share with somebody in church who you have invited. And we'll uh, put ourselves to prayer and praying for that individual also along with you. So come on, church, let's keep this going, and let's just reap what God, the blessings that God wants to pour upon us. We're going to turn over now to Senior Corral, and I know they're going to bless us as they lift up the name of the Lord.
tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. But seems each time I tell it, oh, wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, but some
Why don't we all just stand while we bring in our offering? Come set your rule and Give the folks a moment to sit. 
Amen. I enjoyed uh, Reuben speaking this morning. And it's easy to spot a bachelor, isn't it? He says he dresses himself. Brothers, when you get married, your wife tells you what to wear. And they're worse than your mommy, believe me. You're not wearing that, are you? <laughs> Amen. It's worse too when your daughters join in. But there we go. You want to read with me tonight? Turn to Ephesians 1. A very simple message. And I was thinking of a title and I was just thinking that little song. I know I am. I'm sure I am. Do you remember that? I'm H A P P Y. And I want to talk about the knowledge that we are saved. So let's look at what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Let me just trust the Lord to bless His Word to our hearts this evening. Just thinking of this and reading this, you know, there are not many things in life that we can be totally sure of, that we can be certain about. But, you know, there is one thing that we can be certain of, and that is our salvation in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, many Christians have at times doubted their salvation. They sometimes allow themselves to uh, remember their past. They sometimes slip and fall, and, and they doubt that they were saved. Along with these other negative thoughts, they, they wrestle with this, what is for them, an uncertainty. And, you know, Satan and his demons can use this doubt to, to rob us of this thought about our salvation. I, I know people, I've spoke to people, and because of what they've done in their life, they think they can't be saved. You know, they, they cannot be saved. I, I spoke to a, a young man uh, in his 20s, and his criminal record with, uh, let's just say, sexual abuse was horrendous. And I remember him telling me that, how could God even think about loving someone like me? And Satan wants us to think that, wants us to uh, dwell in that. I've even spoken to Christians on their deathbed, and been surprised. Many of them have been on the road longer than I have, and they've said to me, Pastor, am I really saved? And obviously, it was a pleasure to assure them that they are saved. So, it's not unique to any individual, and I think if we're all honest tonight, we could say that there, ha there has bound to have been times in our lives when we've kind of doubted, not Jesus, but doubted ourselves. And that's what makes us lose sight of the fact that we are saved. And nothing can change that. And I don't think it's a problem unique to our generation because Paul, I believe, addresses this many times. In fact, all the gospel writers address this. And Paul here sets out uh, for the Ephesian church and for us today facts that should reassure us of our salvation so that when Satan tempts us or the old carnal man tries to remind us of who we really are, we can say with confidence and with boldness that I am saved. I've spoke to Christians who have told me, you know, in their own head they're thinking, I'm a hypocrite. You know, they've done something wrong or, or they've said something they shouldn't have said and they begin to listen to this negativity and believe they're not saved. But we are, and I believe Paul reinforces that for us. Because Paul said that we are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And this tells me that it was God's eternal plan. This was God's eternal plan to draw out and choose a people for His name. This was His purpose. This was His plan. And we know that sin interrupted that plan. Uh, you can say that sin broke that plan. I would say interrupted rather than broke. 
When Satan tempted Eve and both her and Adam took of the forbidden fruit and sin came into the world. But the Lord had a plan. In His mercy, He had a plan for fallen man. God did not abandon us. God did not give us up. Before you were born, the Lord knew you. David says when he was formed in the womb, the Lord knew him. The Lord knew your strength, knew your feelings, knew your weaknesses. But in love and mercy, He chose to save you. He chose you, who maybe the world will reject, but God chose you. And I want you all to know that. And those of you who maybe tonight haven't committed their lives to the Lord, or maybe have gone a bit cold, God chose you. And how do we know He chose us? How do we know that He did not abandon us or give us up? Well, the Word of God tells me that He became a man to save us. Paul, speaking to his young mentor Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.16, said, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Isn't that wonderful? Great is the mystery of godliness. What's this greatness Paul was talking about? He was talking about God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached uh, unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Who was received up into glory? Read Acts 1. It was Jesus. And Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. Speaking to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.19, he said, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their press, trespasses sorry, unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You see, that's the reality of our situation. The Lord chose to save you. God chose to save me. He didn't choose someone else to do it on His behalf. He chose to do it Himself. He chose to do it Himself by becoming a man. Now, some would question, well, why? Well, we were bound by the law, and the law stood, the covenant stood, and either one or the other of a covenant had to die. God did not choose to wipe out man. But John 4 and 24 said, God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. As the eternal spirit, He cannot die. And so what He did, that He might die on the cross for our sins, was He took upon Himself the form of man. I want you to grasp that this evening. That someone decided to die for you on the cross, but not just anyone. You know, if someone of notoriety did something for you, uh, and you'd be very grateful. If they went out of their way, someone who's well known, if they went out of their way to help you in some way, you would be grateful. You would be so grateful, you would have to say to them, thank you. You would have to acknowledge that what they did for you. I remember watching a documentary about Elvis, and he uh, apparently walked up behind this lady who was admir admiring a Cadillac, and he handed her the keys and told her cheers. And so she testified of uh, how kind Elvis was and accepted what he had done for her. But sadly, men today, when Almighty God, the creator of the universe, decided to become a man, to die on the cross for their sins, they reject Him. They ignore Him. They try with their own philosophy, their own uh, thoughts uh, and ideologies. They, they, they try to put it down, try to challenge it. But I want you to know tonight, Almighty God died on the cross for your sins. Almighty God, think about that. And if that doesn't touch your heart, then I'm just praying for the convicting power of the Holy Ghost to come upon you. Almighty God died for you. And because it was Almighty God that died for you, nothing can change that. I may be able to do some things for you, but someone of more authority than me can come along and change that. Come along and disrupt that. But when God does something, it's sealed by His Spirit. And you tonight can be certain of your salvation because it was Almighty God who died. The price had been paid. What was owed was paid. The only one spotless lamb who could die 
The only one whose sacrifice was worthy died on the cross for your sins. And that assures me of my salvation. Then Paul reminded us that Jesus would save us from our sins. His death on the cross was not in vain. He said, we have redemption through His blood. This is reinforcing what Matthew, it was what is said in Matthew 1 and 21. The angel said, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You know, when you're thinking about your past, when you're thinking of how you've let God down, and we've all done it, and, you know, can I be honest with you tonight? It doesn't matter if you've let God down little or you've let God down big. It's still wrong. Someone steals a pound. Someone steals a million pound. They're both thieves. There's no grades for sin. And sometimes when we think of what we've done, Jesus saved us from that. As I said last week, our slate has been wiped clean. Our blackboard or whiteboard or computer screen, whatever way you want to put it, it has been wiped clean. There's no record of it. And when I read Matthew 1 and 21, it reminds me we needed to be saved. You see, there's people who think they're so good and they've done so well and, and they've worked so hard for God that they don't need to be saved. I've met them. I've talked to them. They think they've achieved their own righteousness, their, 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 their own salvation. Well, not according to the Word of God. The angel told him, he shall save his people. Therefore, they needed to be saved. And whenever we tonight, whenever you tonight, if you're watching this on Facebook or you're, you're sitting here tonight, <clears throat> when you acknowledge that you need to be saved. You acknowledge that you cannot save yourself. There is no way that you can save yourself. Every man and woman needs to come to that humbling moment uh, when they know this, when they know that they need a Savior. I was just thinking of this, I thought of the psalmist. That beautiful psalm he penned, Psalm 55. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. Tonight, if you're here, you don't know, know Jesus. You have to acknowledge you need to be saved. You have to acknowledge you've sinned. Agno I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Nothing can take it away. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done evil in thy sight, that thy mightest be justified when thy speakest and be clear when thy judgest. For behold, I was shaping in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. There's David telling us that even before he came from his mother's womb, he needed to be saved. He was born a sinner. Knowing that we needed to be saved, we can see therefore Jesus as what we looked at last week, if you remember, our wrath offering. Romans 3.25 Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. As we've said tonight, because Jesus paid the price, we know that his sacrifice was worthy. We know that it was accepted. And now in him we are saved, and we are saved because he has forgiven us our sins. He has paid the debt, and because he has paid the debt, he has the power and the authority to to forgive us, and not only to forgive us our sins, but to forget they even happened. What a God we serve. Then Paul said something wonderful, but something man needs to know today. They've listened to Satan's lie for too long. Paul said that Jesus has given us the gift of eternal life. The gift of eternal life. In John 10, 27, 28, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. And I, that's Jesus, give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My question when I read that is, why would Jesus give us something that we already have? Why would Jesus grant something that we already have? Why would he do that? Think about it. If we are immortal, as men, some men believe we are today, 
Why would Jesus take upon himself the form of man, die on the cross to forgive us our sins, and to grant unto us eternal life? Think of that. If the Bible states quite clearly that Jesus gives us eternal life, then my thought would be, well, then outside of Jesus, we do not have eternal life. We do not have eternal life. The world will tell you Satan's lies that you will become a ghost and your, your spirit will walk about and roam about and if you want, you can scare the life out of people you don't like by haunting them. That is Satan's lie. What did Satan say to Eve? Read the Word of God for yourself. He said, Thou shalt not die. He is a liar. And he lied and men have bought that lie. Men have bought that lie. But I want you to know something. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. Well, why would we be told to do that? Because listen, because there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you go. We are heading to the grave. We cannot change that. No man can change that. But Jesus in his mercy grants unto us eternal life. It says, the wage, Romans 6 and 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Satan doesn't want you to believe that. He wants you to believe you're immortal. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his mercy, he freely grants unto those who call upon his name eternal life. And if you're not in Jesus, you do not have eternal life. Satan can't give you it. Only God can call the dead to life. I have even relatives. I have a late aunt of mine when her husband died. Couldn't deal with it. Really, uh, and you can understand that. They'd been together from they were very young teenagers. And so she went to one of these seances. Or these, it was a guy, I think, he appeared in the waterfront or something. And uh, oh, he was calling spirits up everywhere. Do you know something, brothers and sisters? He didn't call my uncle. He called a demon. My uncle's dead in his grave, and he'll stay there till the Lord comes back. Only God can call forth the dead. Oh, what about the witch of Endor? Well, I believe that, that was a demon speaking to God's servant and not the prophet. You can't speak to your loved ones. You know, it's funny how when you watch these programs, I don't watch them, by the way, but when you see clips from these programs, they're always happy, and they're with their family when they speak to the dead. And it's called positive suggestion, and there are people that are really, really good at it. There's a, a Belfast guy, uh, he travels all over the United Kingdom, and I've seen, his, I've seen what he does. And it's just, you know, I mean, the, the stand-up in and, and Northern Ireland when they're in Belfast and they say, oh, there's somebody in this room and they've lost somebody who lived in Belfast. I mean, what they do? Like, I mean, we're all from Belfast. And there are other methods that they can use and they can watch people. And he, has, he had dark hair when he was alive and God loved these people who are tormented and losing someone. They're grasping onto anything that will bring them peace. And these boys are abusing that. You cannot talk to the dead. They are dead. They are sleeping in their graves. They don't know a thing. As far as they're concerned, and thank God for it, it'll be the twinkling of an eye. When you meet them, they might be dead so many years. My mom's dead near 20 years, I'm sure, isn't it? Uh, she, when she wakes, to her it'll be, what happened? A blink of an eye. There's no thought down there. Don't buy Satan's lie tonight. If you're here, and you don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you do not have eternal life. And you will not be granted eternal life. You're mortal. And you will perish without the Lord. Jesus grants unto us eternal life. We have that assurance. And, and that's why there's a hope and there's a peace in us. That not even death can separate us from the love of God because we will hear that trumpet. We will hear the voice of the archangel and we will see our Lord descending if we are asleep in Him. And if we are alive and remain, we'll be caught up to meet Him in the air. That's our confidence tonight. We can say, like Paul said, with confidence that not only are we saved, not only are we forgiven of our sins, 
Not only are we granted unto us eternal life, but you know something, and this is important. Jesus, our great shepherd, has never lost a sheep. Jesus doesn't lose you. John 18, 7 uh, to 9 says, Jesus asked them again, Whom seek you? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I have told you that I am he. If you therefore seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of them, which thou givest me. I have lost none. Nothing can take us away from our salvation. Satan can't come along and tell us we're no longer saved. No one, uh, no uh, elevated minister, in whatever rank or title he holds, can grant you either eternal life or grant you, uh, as they put it, to go to hell. No man has that authority. Is there one righteous judge? Read the, word, the, the book of Revelation. What did John see? He seen a throne, not thrones, a throne, and one that sat upon the throne, the righteous judge, the Lord Jesus Christ. No man can t- t- change that. Paul, I quoted it in Romans 8, 39. I am persuaded. I want to persuade you tonight, church. I want to encourage you tonight, church. That no matter what happens, nothing can separate you from the Lord Jesus Christ. For he said, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Nothing can take it away. The world didn't give it to me. Do you remember the uh, the song the choir sang? The world didn't give it to me. The world can't take it away. Nothing can separate us from God. We have the arms of our Lord Jesus round about us, and nothing can take us from His grip. He won't let go of us. He keeps us. Know that He, what He suffered... Sorry, know that he did not suffer what he suffered. Know that he did not go through what he went through for us just to let Satan take us back again. He wouldn't allow it. We are saved tonight. We are sealed tonight by the Holy Spirit. And nothing can change that. Sealed by God's righteousness. Declared not guilty. Uh, as, As one translation puts it, we have been credited as being righteous. Therefore, being justified with, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why have we got that peace? Because we can step into His very presence, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. There is no other way to come to the Lord unless you're clothed with His righteousness. You know, church, the old man will try and take us away from you. Try and make you believe you're not worthy, and the truth is we're not. But that's the love and that's the mercy of Almighty God. To save someone like me, to forgive the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Sometimes we don't like that. Sure we don't. I remember way back when Brother Alan Comfort took uh, youth church, he asked me to come along. And I made the mistake of letting young people ask me questions. And boy, they cornered me that day. <laughs> and one of them asked me, would the Yorkshire Ripper, I've told you this, would the Yorkshire Ripper, those of us that remember that individual, would he be saved? You know something? He would. He would. If he got down on his knees before Almighty God and repented from what he did. Now, man won't like that. Man wants him to be punished for eternity and to suffer. But Jesus Christ said, whosoever, whosoever, all criminals. And before we start pointing fingers at criminals, we are all uh, sinners. We're all short of the mark of the calling of God. Some of us are away back there. Some of us are fairly close, but we need Jesus to bridge that gap. When Jesus died, he died for all our sins. And as I've said, he not only forgives, he forgets. When you become a Christian... Your sins are as if they never even happened. It is a fact, uh, Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. I thank God on the day of judgment it's Jesus I'm going to stand before. I would not like to stand before man. 
but it's the righteous judge that we will stand for. Do you know why? Because he's told me. He has blotted out the, the, the proper, it's been a while since I've looked at that word, but I remember the proper, trans, not the proper translation, but what that word blotteth out means, completely wiped clean. It's covered. Can't be seen. Gone. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus completely wiped it away. I know Christians and spoke to them privately, and there's things they've done in their life still haunt them. Come on, let it go. Jesus has. Satan wants you to, to suffer for what you did, as it were. But you know, no matter what you did, his blood covers all sin. His blood covers all sin. We read verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, and it is according to the riches of his grace. I love Romans 8. It's a wonderful chapter. And verse 33 and 34 says this, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You know, with the greatest respect to you, it doesn't matter what you think of me or what I think of you. No one can lay any charge against us. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Yes, rather that is risen again, who is at the right hand of God and make an intercession for us. As the musicians come back, come on, I want you to be assured tonight of your salvation. That when you sing this little chorus, I'm not asking the, the team to sing this, but sing it with joy in your heart. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, and all other ground is sinking sand. We are on the solid rock tonight. I told you this before. I remember as a kid on Finicky Road, when my dad came out of the RAF, we lived in Finicky. And on the 12th day, we went and watched the bands. And way back then, even as a young toddler, there was a banner stuck in my mind. And it was a picture of a girl. And she was on this rock, and there was a cross in the rock. And she looked like she was clinging on for dear life. And the winds and the storms were beating against it. But you know, that's a wrong picture. Because we don't have to hold on to Jesus. He's holding on to us. Amen. I never had to hold on to my dad when he took me across the road. He was holding on to me. And Jesus is holding on to you tonight, and he's not going to let you go. You know something? Even when you fail him, he doesn't want to let you go. He wants to pick you up, mend your wound, and get you back in the road. Let's stand. Thank you for your attention tonight. I just hope and trust that God's Word has blessed you. Our brother Richard Gunning is heading away this week. Is it Burkina Faso again, brother? And yes, and brother Louis has gone with him. I'm going to ask them to come forward. Elders, we're just going to pray God's blessing on them. And if you would like to minister to the elders, please come forward as we enter our closing worship. Let's lift up the name of the Lord. Elders, you please come forward and Richard and Louis.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you that we have been in your presence. We thank you, Lord, throughout the day for the comfort of your word, the encouragement from your word, and, Lord, the blessing of just being here knowing that you have been with us. Just let those thoughts that we have heard dwell in our hearts, Lord. Let us meditate over them, Lord, and just be encouraged to know that we are saved once and for eternity by the grace of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us now, O Lord, as we go our separate ways. Grant unto each and every one of us journeying mercies as we give you glory and honor for your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Good night, and the Lord richly bless you.